ranking 12 different versions of Velma from Scooby-Doo. With an instantly recognizable name and iconic group of characters, it's hardly a surprise that the Scooby-Doo franchise has seen dozens of spin-offs, revivals, and adaptations over the last 50 years. Some have been more successful than others, but no matter your opinion on them, there's no denying the franchise's impact on decades worth of audiences. Scooby-Doo's tone, aesthetic, and cast have varied significantly over the years, but most of the main details have remained the same. In action comedy, the story revolves around the adventures of Mystery Incorporated, a group of four teenagers, Velma Dinkley, Fred Jones, Daphne Blake, and Norville, Shaggy Rogers, and their talking Great Dane, Scooby-Doo. Driving around the world in their van, the Mystery Machine, the gang's hijinks are fairly formulaic, with them uncovering what appears to be a supernatural mystery, which is eventually revealed to be the work of an average human. While all of the characters in the franchise are memorable in their own way, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the brains behind the operation, Velma Dinkley. Known for her penchant of losing her glasses and her catchphrase, Jinkies! Velma is one of the few characters in the franchise besides the titular Scooby-Doo to get her own dedicated spin-off. Today we're going to be taking a look at 12 different versions of Velma Dinkley in both animation and live action. Then we'll rank them. Just as a disclaimer, the primary focus is the character herself. So while we'll be providing background information on that specific film or TV show, we'll mostly be discussing Velma's role in that story and what makes that version of her unique, not whether or not that piece of media is any good. Also, this isn't going to include every single appearance Velma has made in the franchise, just her most notable. And obviously, we're going to be talking about her look. Since her introduction five decades ago, Velma has never been spotted without her iconic glasses and signature orange color palette, and they've probably become the character's most identifiable features. Clothing has always been one of the easiest ways to show off your personality, but who says it has to stop there? With all of us carrying our phones everywhere we go, isn't it about time that we started thinking about what they look like? Which brings me to today's sponsor, Casetify. One of the most popular tech accessory brands in the world, Casetify ensures that your device will always be protected while still feeling like you. Casetify has a huge range of cases with different levels of protection, including their brand new bounce case, which can stand drops from up to 21.3 feet, making it their most protective case yet. As someone who is as notorious for dropping their phone as Velma does her glasses, knowing that Casetify is there to save the day when I'm taken by surprise is a huge weight off my shoulders. With over 2,000 designs to choose from, plus customizable options, Casetify makes it easy to find a phone case that fits your needs, and more importantly, your personality. As you can probably tell, I picked out a few cases that were inspired by the Mystery Inc. gang. Does your phone case feel like you? If you're looking for a fun way to show off who you are, head on over to casetify.com slash moderngirls2 today and get 15% off your order. Now let's get back to the video. Jinkies. In the late 60s, Saturday morning programming was in a rut, with parents growing concerned about the type of shows that were airing. And when networks responded with toned down content, reception and ratings tanked. Looking to revitalize his lineup of cartoons, Fred Silverman, the CBS executive in charge of children's programming, contacted producers William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, the minds behind Hanna-Barbera Productions, the animation studio responsible for Tom and Jerry, the Flintstones, and the Jetsons. Silverman envisioned a show that was a cross between the popular I Love a Mystery radio show from the 1940s and the popular 1960s sitcom The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. Hanna and Barbera passed the task to their head writers Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, who came up with the concept of what would later become Scooby-Doo. Originally called Mysteries 5, the show featured five teens and their dog who were in a rock band and solved mysteries in between gigs. The premise of the series was inspired by the growing trend of music-based cartoons in the late 60s like The Archie Show, Groovy Ghoulies, Josie and the Pussycats, and The Beatles cartoon. As the idea was further developed, there were several changes like the characters' names, relationships, and most notably, the mysteries becoming the focus instead of the music. This led to the concept of Who's Sissa Scared, which was turned down by execs who thought it might have been too scary for children. Following this, Ruby and Spears went back to the drawing board and eventually came up with Scooby-Doo Where Are You, which had a more humorous tone and focused on the dynamic between the main characters. The series made its CBS Network debut on September 13, 1969, with its first episode, What a Night for a Night, and it was an immediate success, inspiring the direction for many other Hanna-Barbera shows around the time period. 
Scooby-Doo Where Are You was a major rating success for CBS, and they renewed it for a second season in 1970. Each episode had a similar storyline, with the mystery machine breaking down in an area with some sort of supernatural problem, which the gang would volunteer to solve. They then split up to cover more ground, with Fred and Velma finding clues, Daphne danger, and Shaggy and Scooby food, fun, and the creature itself, setting off a chase. Fred would usually hatch an elaborate plan to try and capture the monster, only for it to go awry. But by sheer luck, they're able to apprehend the villain anyway and uncover their disguise. Once unmasked, the creature would be revealed as some local character the gang had met earlier, who was hoping to use the disguise to accomplish some scheme, leading to the iconic line, And it would have been mine if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. This simple formula would serve as the template for almost every iteration of Scooby-Doo that followed. When the series was first being created, Ruby and Spears were looking for balance amongst their primary cast of characters. For example, since Shaggy was a carefree and cowardly hippie, Fred had to be the brave leader. However, this created an issue when they were developing the female characters. Initially, Velma was supposed to be paired up with Shaggy romantically, being an art-loving hippie herself. But this concept didn't complement their vision for Daphne, who was already a beautiful damsel in distress. In order to make the female characters foils of one another, Velma was given a simpler appearance, as well as the smarts that the rest of the group lacked. I have wondered if Velma was supposed to be Asian initially, with a character having darker hair and a different eye shape in original concept art. This wouldn't have been a huge stretch of the imagination, considering Japanese-American artist Iwao Takamoto was lead character designer for the series. Each character had a specific role within the show, as well as a clearly defined personality and color palette, with the latter being incredibly important because of the way children interact with TV characters. Velma is most often depicted and recognized for her oversized orange turtleneck, burgundy pleated skirt, orange knee socks, Mary Janes, short brown bob, and big black square glasses. Like all of the characters, Velma had a running gag, losing her glasses and being utterly unable to see. Another running gag occurs when other frightened characters leap into her arms and she carries them, displaying her comically impressive amount of strength despite how petite she is. Taking inspiration from Zelda Gilroy, a character from The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, Velma was depicted as the quintessential geeky character from the get-go, showing an interest in science and referencing various books. Out of the group, she's the most skeptical about paranormal activity, instead believing that there's a more realistic explanation, which is indeed the case. Because of her sharp wit, Velma also had a sarcastic sense of humor, with many of her sly remarks going over the other characters' heads. After two seasons, which consisted of 25 half-hour episodes, Scooby-Doo Where Are You ended its original run in October 1970, but was followed by the new Scooby-Doo movies in 1972. Still airing on CBS, this series was a continuation of the original show, but each episode was now an hour long and had rotating guest stars of real-life celebrities like Sonny and Cher, as well as well-known characters like Batman and the Addams Family. Nicole Jaff wound up voicing the character of Velma Dinkley in both of these series. The new Scooby-Doo movies went on for two seasons, eventually ending in 1974 after 24 episodes. Jinkies! When Fred Silverman moved from CBS to ABC in 1975, the Scooby-Doo gang followed him, making their ABC debut in 1976 as part of the Scooby-Doo show, an umbrella title referring to various projects that were produced around this time period. This began with the Scooby-Doo Dynamut Hour, which as the name implies, had one segment dedicated to Scooby-Doo and another to Dynamut the Dog Wonder, a different Hanna-Barbera cartoon. The entire Mystery Inc. crew only appeared in a handful of these episodes. This was followed by Scooby-Doo's All-Star Laugh Olympics in 1977, a two-hour program block which featured various Hanna-Barbera cartoons. New Scooby-Doo Where Are You episodes began airing in 1978 but followed the original series format, marking the return of Velma and the rest of the gang. Most of these projects focused on the more marketable Scooby-Doo, and the character of Velma went unchanged from her depiction a decade earlier. The only difference was her voice, with Pat Stevens taking over following the retirement of Nicole Jaff. Jankies. By 1979, Scooby-Doo's ratings had slipped to the point that ABC was considering canceling the entire series, and in a desperate attempt to reinvigorate audience interest, they introduced a new character, Scrappy-Doo. In spite of how the character is perceived today, Scrappy was positively received by contemporary viewers, and following an overhaul in 1980, he began sharing the spotlight with Scooby in TV episodes and telefilms. 
The series format changed from a group of teens solving mysteries to more slapstick adventures starring Shaggy, Scrappy, and Scooby, which involved real supernatural villains instead of normal people in disguise. Several shows under the Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo title aired throughout the early 80s, but with the new dynamic caused by Scrappy's introduction, many of the original characters were deemed unnecessary, with Fred, Daphne, and Velma making fewer and fewer appearances, before eventually being dropped entirely. The absence of these characters may also have something to do with the 1980 actor strike, with voice actress Pat Stevens quitting the series in solidarity, with Marla Frumpkin replacing her as Velma for a handful of episodes, which is considered by fans as one of the worst vocal iterations of the character. Jinkies! What's going on? Hmm, I guess we'll have to look for clues. Originally titled Scooby-Doo The Puppy Years, 1988's A Pup Named Scooby-Doo was the eighth incarnation of the Scooby franchise, getting rid of Scrappy and bringing the original gang back together for the first time since 1980. The premise of the series was similar to the original 1969 show, with the gang, then referred to as the Scooby-Doo Detective Agency, solving mysteries around Coolsville. What made it unique was that it employed a new format inspired by the popular trend of babyfying older cartoon characters, with shows like Muppet Babies, Flintstone Kids, and the new Archies using a similar technique. Because the characters were aged down, child actors were used for most of the main cast, with Christina Lang taking over the role of Velma Dinkley. By making all of the characters younger versions of themselves, there was a cuteness element that some of these shows were previously missing, while simultaneously creating humorous situations by having characters who looked like children, but behaved like adults. The tone of the show was significantly more zany than Scooby-Doo Where Are You, foregoing any sense of reality in favor of a more Looney Tunes-esque style of comedy. The series was developed by Tom Rugger, who wanted to pay homage to the franchise's past by poking fun at many of its tropes and recurring gags. While Shaggy and Scooby went largely unchanged from their adult counterparts, the personalities of the other characters were exaggerated to fit the series' tone, and this is one of the first instances where we see Velma diverge from her original characterization. At least, a tiny bit. While she's still passionate about science, it isn't just to make the character appear geeky, with Velma actually inventing different gadgets to help the gang solve mysteries. She's also more shy and soft-spoken than her original counterpart, largely because Rugger had initially intended to have the character only say her catchphrase, saying in an interview, quote, My original goal was to have Velma only say the word jinkies throughout the entire series. Just jinkies. That's it. So with the first episode, the pilot written by Charlie Howell, Jim Ryan, and me, Velma said jinkies, and almost nothing else. Then with the subsequent episodes, written by the news story editors, suddenly Velma was just blabbing away. I debated the issue with the story editors, and resisted having her talk, but eventually it became too exhausting a battle. Ultimately, Velma did say a few things, but she would be a bigger, better, and more memorable character today if all she ever said had been Jinkies. Jinkies! I said Jinkies! Instead of her signature orange turtleneck sweater, this Velma wears a white long sleeve shirt and a sweater vest. She also swaps out her orange knee socks for white ones helping her look more juvenile. As an early example of Western chibi, both her head and glasses are comically oversized for the rest of her body, giving her one of the more adorable designs out of the gang. The retooled show was a success, ending in 1991 after four seasons on ABC, and it might have gone on for even longer if Turner Entertainment hadn't purchased Hanna-Barbera Productions that same year, which made a pup named Scooby-Doo the last Scooby-Doo TV series for more than a decade. Jinkies! In the 90s, everyone was trying to get a piece of the billion-dollar direct-to-video pie, and considering Scooby-Doo's growing popularity because of reruns on Cartoon Network and its easy-to-replicate formula, it made perfect sense to move the franchise away from TV and towards the home video market. Following Turner Entertainment's merger with Time Warner in 1996, Hanna-Barbera Productions became a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, and working together, the two studios aimed to create one new Scooby-Doo movie a year starting with Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island in 1998. There are now 37 direct-to-video movies total, and obviously we can't talk about each of them, so for now, we're just going to talk about the original generation. The first four direct-to-video films, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders, and Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, are arguably the most popular and well-known amongst fans of the franchise. Not so coincidentally, all four of these films had assistance from Mook Animation, a Japanese animation studio, and compared to the movies that followed, these looked more cinematic and edgy, 
tying into the film's darker direction, which pitted Mystery Inc. against actual supernatural forces. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, the first installment of the direct-to-video series, was both a critical and commercial success, being praised for honoring the past while still bringing something new to the table. The film was aided by a $50 million promotional campaign, with sponsorship deals with multiple companies, like Wendy's. The film was able to turn a huge profit by keeping costs low by releasing the film straight to video, so continuing with more Scooby-Doo films was a no-brainer. Voiced by B.J. Ward, Velma's personality is largely the same as previous counterparts, although perhaps a touch more outspoken, perhaps due to the character being a young adult instead of a teenager. To better suit the film's 90s setting and audience, members of the main cast were redesigned and given contemporary clothing styles. Fred and Daphne had the greatest evolution, while Shaggy went largely unchanged. Velma was somewhere in the middle, still wearing her signature orange turtleneck, but donning an A-line skirt instead of a pleated one, and replacing her knee-high socks with ankle-length ones. Velma dresses the same in 1999's The Witch's Ghost, the movie that famously introduced the public to the Hex Girls, a female eco-goth rock band, who have since become favorites of the fandom. 2000's Alien Invaders marks Velma's first style change, with the warmer climate inspiring her to change into an oversized orange t-shirt, red shorts, and comfortable sneakers. In 2001's Cyber Chase, Velma returns to her outfit from the first two films, and while there isn't as drastic a change as Daphne or Fred, it's still funny when she bumps into her 70s counterpart. Cyber Chase would be the final Hanna-Barbera production to be executive produced by both William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, with Hanna passing in 2001, and the film was subsequently dedicated to his memory. It was also the last direct-to-video movie that included the original production team due to creative differences, with the subsequent release, 2002's Legend of the Vampire, taking on the animation style and lighter tone of the TV series What's New Scooby-Doo, which was simultaneously airing. Jinkies! Live-action versions of cartoons and comics were all the rage in the 90s and 2000s, with movies like The Flintstones, The Addams Family, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and Josie and the Pussycats. And with their over-the-top, tongue-in-cheek humor, the kinder camp genre was born. We have a video all about it if you're interested in learning more. In 2002, the Scooby-Doo franchise hit the big screen with a live-action adaptation written by James Gunn and directed by Raja Gosnell. Scooby-Doo the movie introduced us to the oldest versions of Mystery Inc. so far, with the characters being in their mid-twenties. In the film, the gang has disbanded for several years following an argument, but are forced back together to investigate the mysterious mishaps happening on Spooky Island, where they discover what seems to be an actual supernatural villain. While critics hated the movie, it was a hit with the franchise's older fans, and became a box office success, prompting the studio to move forward with a sequel in 2004. Monsters Unleashed was similarly negatively received by critics, although fans once again showed up for the movie, but it did wind up grossing about $100 million less than its predecessor. Because of this lackluster box office performance, a third film, set to be written and directed by Gunn, was cancelled. The main cast included Matthew Lillard as Shaggy, Sarah Michelle Gellar as Daphne, Freddie Prince Jr. as Fred, and Linda Cardellini as Velma, which let's be honest, was perfect casting all around. As a kinder camp film, certain aspects of the characters' personalities were purposely exaggerated in order to parody their previous stereotypical characterization, with Fred becoming an arrogant jock, Shaggy a silly stoner, Daphne a fashion-obsessed diva, and Velma an uptight nerd. This played into the audience's preconceived notions about the characters, thereby allowing the film to subvert expectations, like Daphne learning martial arts in order to no longer be the quintessential damsel in distress. James Gunn actually intended for the movie to be a grown-up version of the animated TV series, with a darker tone and adult humor, even hoping to release it with an R rating. Studio involvement and the fact that the franchise's target demographic were kids changed these plans significantly. Thelma was one of the characters who was noticeably affected by this micromanaging, with Gunn stating that she was meant to be explicitly gay, finding herself attracted to Daphne and the two even kissing. Now before anyone says, oh of course he's saying that, everyone wants to be woke nowadays, there are literally cut scenes from the movie that confirm it. Linda Cardellini is perhaps one of the most beloved incarnations of Velma, with the character still being a sarcastic know-it-all, but also having insecurities that we sympathize with, and the sequel film is all about her journey of self-discovery and acceptance. In the first film, she mostly wears an iteration of her standard look, just with a different skirt and shoes giving her a slightly more modern appearance while still staying true to the character. This creates a sharp contrast to Daphne, 
who wears several outfits over the course of the film, which not only highlights their differences in personality, but also the rift in their friendship. Velma sports a slightly different look after she gets possessed, donning a tight, low-cut shirt, removing her glasses, and sporting a flipped-out bob. And it's very obvious to the audience that this isn't Velma, which shows how clearly her character has been defined over the years. In the sequel film, she's given a few more outfits, including this iconic catsuit. And I love the 70s influence on everything she wears, which pays homage to the time of the character's creation. Kudos to costume designer Lisa Evans for doing such a phenomenal job on both of these movies. Jinkies! Following the popularity of the original show's reruns on Cartoon Network and the direct-to-video Scooby-Doo releases, the gang was updated for the 21st century in 2002's What's New Scooby-Doo. Unlike previous Scooby-Doo projects, the show was produced at Warner Brothers Television Animation, which had absorbed Hanna-Barbera in 2001. The show returned to the familiar comedic mystery format of the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You series, but added modern-day technology and pop culture references to give the series a more contemporary feel. Case in point, the iconic theme song now being sung by rock band Simple Plan. The show frequently paid homage to past Scooby-Doo incarnations, most directly a pup named Scooby-Doo, setting the two series in the same continuity. It was also the first piece of Scooby-Doo media where Joe Ruby and Ken Spears were thanked directly for their contributions to the franchise, as previously the vast majority of credit had gone to Hanna-Barbera. As a revival of the 1969 series, Velma's characterization is similar to that of her original counterpart, with the only notable difference being her romantic interests, with one of the show's recurring storylines being antagonist Gibby Norton, who repeatedly tries to woo her despite her turning down his advances. Velma's primary outfit in the show resembles the one worn by the character in the first live-action movie, down to the platform shoe and skirt. She also gets a good deal of one-off outfits throughout the series, including a Renaissance Fair dress, scuba suit, and a wrestling singlet. Actress Mindy Cohn voiced the character in both the series and the direct-to-video movies, tying the two together and making it clear that they were the same version of Velma. The series wasn't as positively received by critics as others, but it still wound up being renewed for three seasons before ending in 2006. Jinkies! In 2009, the first of two live-action made-for-TV movies were released. Directed by Brian Levant, the movies followed Mystery Inc. in their teens, with the first film serving as an origin story, showing how the gang all met and solved their first case together. The second follows the usual Scooby-Doo formula of the gang solving a supernatural mystery. Surprisingly, these films were received rather positively, with critics praising their loyalty to the source material. Scooby-Doo The Mystery Begins even became the most-watched telecast in Cartoon Network history, with 6.1 million viewers. Singer-slash-actress Hailey Kiyoko starred as Velma, making it the first time the character was canonically non-white in the Scooby-Doo universe, although this had no effect on her storyline. Velma's personality is similar to that of the other live-action film, with the character being smart but socially awkward but she seems less confident than that version of the character, which makes sense since she's a good deal younger. The film also touches on an idea introduced during the franchise conception, with Velma and Shaggy considering entering a relationship, but deciding against it due to a lack of chemistry and a fear of breaking up the friend group. The costuming in these films are very of its time, with Velma having a hipster, geek chic style that was popular in the late 2000s. While she wears a straightforward interpretation of her signature outfit, which is to be expected at this point, she throws in some patterned socks which are at least somewhat unique. These films weren't afraid to stray away from Velma's signature color palette, and we see her in more white, green, and blue than usual, making her look a touch more realistic. She also wears significantly more patterns than past iterations, especially Argyle, which is associated with preppy style. Jinkies! In 2010, the animated series Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated was released, which followed the gang as they solved mysteries in their hometown, which was renamed from Coolsville to Crystal Cove. Like most of the newer incarnations of Scooby-Doo, the series makes references to previous iterations and has a more tongue-in-cheek style of humor, with the scenarios becoming increasingly outlandish as the series progresses. The show pays homage to the horror genre by referencing classics like A Nightmare on Elm Street, as well as more modern films like Saw. Other Hanna-Barbera characters also made guest appearances, similar to the new Scooby-Doo movies back in 1972. Instead of standalone episodes that didn't need to be watched in any specific order, Mystery Incorporated had storylines that progressed over the course of the series' entire 52-episode run, including one where Shaggy and Velma began dating and had to keep it a secret from Scooby. 
Unlike the vast majority of Scooby-Doo projects from the 21st century, Mystery Incorporated made very few changes to the character's original 1969 outfits, leaning into the self-referential humor of the series. Velma did get a slight update, with the character now wearing bows in her hair, which I actually think is a pretty fun addition as her hair had never been experimented with before, and it plays into the character's romance-driven storyline. Still voiced by Mindy Cohn, this version of Velma is the most sassy and snarky so far, which actually makes her feel like one of the most developed versions of the character. She's still just as clever as ever, but by making her dry humor a bigger part of her personality, we can feel Velma's frustration at being the smartest person in the room while still being overlooked, as well as her annoyance with Shaggy. I'm sure some fans of the franchise hate this version of the character since she can be rather passive-aggressive and moody, but I personally think that this emotional immaturity makes her seem more realistic and thereby empathetic. The show's sharper and spookier art style made it look vastly different from other incarnations of the series, and with its darker tone, strong storylines, and developed characters, the show was subject to critical acclaim and is considered one of the best Scooby-Doo properties by fans. Jankies. The 12th TV incarnation of Scooby-Doo, the 2015 series follows the gang as they set out on an adventure during their final summer vacation of high school, with their fun constantly being hindered by monsters and mayhem. Because Mystery Incorporated had such a dark tone, Be Cool Scooby-Doo placed more emphasis on comedy, something reflected in the series' art style, which was reminiscent of other shows from the time period like Gravity Falls and Rick and Morty. This drastic change was controversial when the series was first released, being criticized for its departure from the usual Scooby-Doo look, as well as seemingly copying other popular projects, but it was also praised for fitting the tone of the show. While the art style makes these versions of the characters look unique at a quick glance, Velma's outfit is no different from her 1969 counterpart, but considering the character is depicted as a high-strung hipster, the retro look works. Now voiced by Kate Micucci, many of Velma's tried-and-true quirks and running gags are exaggerated, like being so smart that colleges apply to her, carrying the entire gang on her back, literally, and becoming obsessed with video games. I'd also consider her less of a know-it-all than past iterations, with her sense of humor being more self-deprecating than sassy. This is probably one of the most divisive Scooby-Doo series due to its animation style and meta-humor, and after two seasons, it was cancelled. Jankies! In 2018, yet another live-action Scooby-Doo project was released, Daphne and Velma, which as you can infer, centers around those two characters with no mention of the other members of Mystery Inc. This decision was a clear product of the times, with the movie following in the footsteps of other female-focused girl power adaptations of male-dominant IP like Ghostbusters and Ocean's 8. In the film, Daphne and Velma are online friends who eventually meet when they begin attending the same high school. Both girls are interested in solving mysteries, with Daphne believing in the supernatural, while Velma is more logical. Although they have a small tiff, they make up and decide to work together to figure out why the school's smartest students have been disappearing. Because the film set out to subvert expectations, Velma and Daphne's relationship, while strained initially, is healthy and supportive, with Velma protecting Daphne and Daphne standing up for her in front of their peers. Velma is still sassy and sarcastic, but instead of making her come across as a know-it-all, it instead feels like a realistic depiction of an angsty teenager who's used to being ignored. Instead of the character's usual skirts, Velma regularly wears jeans and overalls, which I actually think makes more sense for the character. She still sports a lot of knitwear, but in different silhouettes and colors than her usual turtleneck. There's also recurring motifs of animals, which I think is meant to make the character look more playful and childish. Some of the outfits are a bit jarring to look at, but you know what? They're still better than a lot of what Daphne wears in the movie. Although I do wish they'd given Sarah Gilman a better wig to wear, because this one looks bad. Jankies. In 2020, we saw the first theatrical release of an animated Scooby-Doo project, with Scoob taking the franchise in a CGI direction. Taking place in an alternate Hanna-Barbera multiverse where Mystery Inc. met his children, Scoob follows the gang as they investigate Scooby-Doo's mysterious background. Unlike many of the other TV projects from the 21st century, it doesn't attempt to subvert expectations of the franchise, instead following a familiar Scooby-Doo formula, but updating it by focusing on the characters' personalities and their relationship to one another. This version of Velma is less sarcastic and more generally funny, which makes the character feel more approachable than many of her other counterparts, and we also see her have a closer bond with both Shaggy and Scooby. 
The character's science savvy is once again on full display, with Velma hacking a computer and sequencing DNA from a hair sample. But I feel as though the character feels less geeky than other iterations and more like a mad scientist. Velma is voiced by Latina actress Gina Rodriguez, whose background wound up influencing the direction of the character, resulting in Velma having darker skin and more noticeably auburn hair. She wears the usual orange turtleneck and red skirt, but instead of Mary Jane's or loafers, she's now donning combat boots, which gives her a more modern and edgy feel. We also see this version of Velma dress up as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which feels incredibly on brand for the character. Although Warner Brothers had initially announced a Christmas sequel film titled Scoob 2 Holiday Haunt, in August 2022 they backtracked, stating that although the film would still be completed, they had no plans to release it. As of this video, that's still the case, with the finished film doomed to become a piece of lost media. Jinkies! The most recent Scooby-Doo project is 2023's Velma, which has stirred up quite the response from fans and critics alike, and has been called the Great Unifier, being criticized by liberals for being regressive, while simultaneously being denounced by conservatives for being too progressive. Primarily revolving around Velma Dinkley, the show is significantly more adult than any of the past projects combined, featuring graphic violence, sexual humor, and profanity. Developed and created by Charlie Grandy, the series is executive produced by Mindy Kaling, who also voices the titular character, and her impact on the show's humor and themes is impossible to ignore. Taking place in an alternate universe, the show serves as Velma Dinkley's origin story, with the character trying to solve the disappearance of her mother and the numerous murders of local teenagers. Apart from Scooby-Doo, who Warner Brothers didn't allow to be in the show, the other members of Mystery Inc. make appearances, with the show featuring a love quadrangle between Velma, Daphne, Shaggy, and Fred. Within the Scooby-Doo fandom, Velma has been headcanoned as a lesbian for decades, with James Gunn wanting to take the character in that direction 20 years ago. But the first project to actually confirm the theory was the 2020 direct-to-video movie, Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo, with Velma developing a crush on the female villain, Coco Diablo. This didn't set off any backlash at the time, likely because the depiction didn't feel disingenuous. In the 2023 series, Velma is openly queer, but instead of seeming like a win for representation, it feels cheap and lazy, especially since Daphne and Velma are characterized as hating each other within the context of the series, and most of their interactions are hypersexualized to the point that it feels exploitative. Although I'm on board with the idea of an adult Scooby-Doo series with adult humor, I found myself being uncomfortable with how oversexualized everything was, especially since the characters are still supposed to be teenagers. There are some pretty obvious sexual innuendos in the live-action movies from the 2000s, but at least all of the actors, and therefore the characters, were in their 20s, so it didn't feel gross. Considering Velma is so non-canonical, I don't see why they couldn't have had it set in college. Besides Fred, the members of Mystery Inc. are no longer white, with Shaggy, now known as Norville, being black, Daphne, East Asian, and Velma, Indian. This change obviously upset a certain group of people, but I'm personally all for it. In response to the backlash, Kaling said, quote, I think of the characters in this as so iconic, but in no way is the gang defined by their whiteness, except for Fred. And I think most Indian American girls, when they see this skeptical, hardworking, kind of underappreciated character, can identify with her. Considering the characters have quite literally been depicted as white in dozens of other Scooby-Doo projects, having them be POC for once is nothing to get your panties in a twist over. Plus, some of the characters have been non-white before, and I didn't see anyone going on and on about it then. My problem with the race swapping in Velma is that it isn't incorporated into the story in a meaningful way, with some of the characters even falling into stereotype territory. While the characters' personalities are somewhat reminiscent of their original counterparts, all of their worst attributes are amplified, making them all instantly unlikable. This is especially the case for Velma, who is more of a know-it-all than ever before, to the point where she often comes across as condescending and ignorant instead of quick-witted and intelligent. Although past versions of Velma have been socially awkward, she's never been selfish, judgmental, or manipulative, which this Velma certainly is, making her such an unpleasant character that we can't bring ourselves to root for her. This becomes a huge issue when the character attempts to be vulnerable, as we wind up feeling like she kind of deserves it. Velma is also insecure about her appearance, which is framed as less about her lacking self-confidence and more of a snarky response to standards of beauty in society. But once again, because the character is so unlikable, 
the point falls flat. I'm fairly certain that the people involved in the creation of Velma were expecting the backlash to their many changes, with the show's trailer directly mocking people on the internet who get up in arms about updates to their favorite shows. If there is one thing the internet agrees on, it's that you should never change anything ever. I hope you die. But what I think they underestimated was the fact that no one would like it. The question I, and many fans of the Scooby-Doo franchise have, is why was this show even made? Nothing about it screams Scooby-Doo besides the character names, costuming, and the mystery element, which makes it feel like a cheap ploy to use the franchise's pre-built fanbase and reputation for views. Although it's become one of the lowest audience-rated TV series of all time, Belma's second season is currently in development proving the age-old saying that any publicity is good publicity. Now that we've gone through these 12 different versions of Velma Dinkley, it's time to rank them, starting with the worst and ending with the best. As always, this is my opinion, so don't freak out if my favorite isn't yours. Mindy Kaling I mean, are we really surprised? This is the only version of the character that I actively dislike. If this was how she'd been depicted from the very beginning of the franchise, she never would have made it out of the 70s. Plus, the changes that I could theoretically appreciate about the character are so poorly conceived that I'd rather they weren't made at all. Pat Stevens I know you're probably wondering, why is this getting such a low score? It's basically Scooby-Doo, where are you? And that's precisely the problem. Considering they'd made the jump from CBS to ABC, I was expecting a little more creativity. Instead, I got more of the same. Mindy Cohn. Once again, I'm just not very impressed by how derivative this series is. The only reason this Velma isn't ranked lower is because she at least has some fun outfits. Haley Kyoko. It's incredibly obvious that this version of the character was inspired by Linda Cardellini's, and while that isn't necessarily a bad thing, in the context of these movies, it winds up making her feel like a teen stereotype. She comes across as a generic brainiac, and there's really nothing about her that feels uniquely Velma. BJ Ward They did exactly what they set out to do with this version of Velma, with the character having many of the same characteristics as her 1969 counterpart, just a bit older and adjusted for the 90s. It's a solid take on the character, but just not as interesting as some of her other iterations. Sarah Gilman I won't lie, this Velma isn't the most fashionable. Not only because trends have changed, but because some of the outfits were a choice. Like that dog sweater, yike. The character herself is still sarcastic, but in an endearing way, and I loved seeing the development of her friendship with Daphne. Gina Rodriguez. One of the more likable versions of Velma, she's funny, but not necessarily snarky, and I like that her friendship with the rest of the gang feels more flushed out. I also appreciate that her Latina background feels naturally integrated into the story, but doesn't actually change who she is at her core. I do wonder how the character would have progressed in the cancelled sequel. Christina Lang Out of all the Scooby-Doo projects we've talked about today, this is the one that feels like it's most obviously for kids, which is the point, so I'm not mad about it. This is probably the cutest Velma's acted and looked, but admittedly, most of the jokes only work if you have some background knowledge of who the character is. Nicole Jaff It probably sounds sacrilegious to put her here considering she's the original, but hear me out. While this version of Velma has my respect for introducing us to the now iconic character, there is nothing about her that's all that interesting. She's just a bunch of gags and tropes mashed together, and after watching a single episode, you'll already have learned everything there is to know about the character. Mindy Cohn If you haven't seen this series yet, I highly recommend looking into it, especially if you're a fan of horror. Aided by its serial format, Velma's character has a clear arc over the course of the story, and the ups and downs of her relationship with Shaggy are genuinely interesting. This version of the character feels the most like a real teen to me, even if that means that sometimes she isn't the nicest person in the world. Kate Micucci If you can get past the dramatic change in art style, this is genuinely one of the best Scooby-Doo series. The humor is top-notch, the character is well thought out, and the mystery is entertaining. Awkward but in a relatable way, this still feels like Velma, just less stereotypically geeky. Linda Cardellini Adapting an animated series into live action is no easy task, but Scooby-Doo the movie proved that it can be done. 
While the character is obviously the Velma Dinkley we know and love, her insecurities and social awkwardness make her feel more like a real person, and I appreciate that we can actually see her develop over the course of the two movies. Also, can we just talk about the orange catsuit? The only thing that could have made this version of Velma even better is if she'd been gay. Which version of Velma Dinkley is your favorite? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon!